Our next pre uh, presenter is Ken Salenza. Did I get that right? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, he'll be presenting Next Generation Firewall Automation. Ken is the VP of Professional Services at Network to Code, and this is his first time. We are certainly very happy to have you here today. So as previously alluded to, I'm Ken Salenza, uh, VP of Professional Services at a company called Network to Code. Specialized in network automation. Uh, I've been involved in dozens of projects uh, with network automation over the last half decade or so. <clears throat> I was your traditional network engineer uh, by day, coder by night throughout my career. I converted to full time network automator in 2016 when I came to Network to Code. <clears throat> I've been in the industry over 20 years, uh, primarily supporting enterprises uh, through four. The Air Force, McKinsey, and Network to Code, of course. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that was now what I was supposed to do. Okay. I think I got it now. Apologies. Okay. So, quick agenda. We're going to go through uh, manual firewall rules, about management, how it currently happens for most organizations, and talk about what I'm uh, coining as current generation uh, firewall rule automation, and then what I'm coining as next generation firewall automation. And then we're going to do a demo. It's going to be a little bit of a different demo, because there is no uh, cable here. So I pre-recorded it. I'm going to be talking to it live. So bear with me if my timing is slightly off. Okay, so manual firewall rule management. This is kind of what I see for most organizations as we get integrated to potentially talk to them about automating such processes. We'll see a workflow. We see a workflow is something like this, uh, which is basically a user makes a request, oftentimes an Excel document or similar. Some security person reviews it for uh, Validity, whether it's a good rule or not, what path analysis, what type of fire, which firewalls it should go on, um, potentially multiple firewalls. Go through a CAD review process to schedule that uh, that change, um, and finally, of course, implementation and closing on ticket. Again, very simple, but just want to kind of reset ourselves here uh, overall. <clears throat> okay. So when I work with uh, our customers, this is kind of generally speaking, what we do is talk about this next step, which is current firewall animation. I am getting some signal here. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I, I did not realize that was a button. My apologies, folks. So, sorry for driving you guys crazy. Okay. <laughs> Egg in my face, that one. Oh, so now I need to go back. Okay, sorry about that, folks. All right, so current firewall rule mission. This is what I kind of typically work with the customers on. And we start developing a workflow similar to this. Uh, I kind of highlight here which uh, parts of the workflow will be automated versus not automated. So standard, you know, user makes a request uh, into an ITSM tool, oftentimes a service now or something similar. The operator still goes through, reviews that process. But then we get into some of the steps that can more often be automated. Some of that pre-validation uh, uh, steps. Do things like the security review, uh, uh, the, the security review to say what's a good rule if it can be programmatically detected as an example. Do things like that path analysis. Oftentimes things like an automated trace route as an example or an IPM lookup. Okay. Go to that standard uh, CAB review process. And then go through pre-checks. Most common pre-check, I'll kind of talk about the Palo Alto world, which is to do that test policy uh, uh, command to see if, in fact, pre-change that the policy or the, the traffic is not allowed so that we can verify in the post-check that it is allowed. All right. You, of course, deploy the configuration, which is obviously a big part of any automation, and do that post-check, which is the flip side to that, those pre-checks that happens. And, of course, close out the ticket. <clears throat> okay, so there are a lot of benefits for this, and I wouldn't dissuade anyone from, from going this, this route. 
we're going to talk about the other side of this as well. But so first and foremost, to standardize and normalize your configurations. I always say that um, I may use dashes and Joe is going to use underscores. It makes it harder to parse the configurations later. You get that form validation to ensure a reasonable level of quality instead of those spreadsheets. So if someone's using an ITSM tool, the, there's actual form validation to say it's an IP address or an IP range, etc. Enables customers to sell provision, which helps reduce time to market. Right? They can, if they are a technical savvy customer, they can create that request and see the automation go through without it potentially any erection themselves with the security team. <clears throat> Provides traceability of that, uh, those configuration pushes. And we'll talk about what some of the traceability doesn't provide, uh, but it does. And you can go back and say, this one rule was deployed on this day for this reasons and so forth. And reduces that monotonous task and associated fatigue. I work with some organizations where they are literally dealing with hundreds of firewall rule changes a day. And that's just gonna, you're just gonna mess up at times there. There's no two ways about it. Okay, but we're gonna talk about next generation. So what's the problem statement here? What are some of the cons associated with this? It requires expert level knowledge on how applications and networks work. work. We as network engineers, security engineers, will oftentimes uh, not really remember what it was like to not know these things. But I've had heard from hundreds of application developers not understand the idea of uh, bi-directional traffic and where the TCP SYN is being sent, thinking because information is going to and fro that it should uh, be bi-directional. But obviously, we as network engineers know that's not the case. <clears throat> it is not an intended state. Uh, it doesn't provide the intended state source of truth and from a structure. Can't get that declarative configuration as an example. Okay. Rule creation is difficult to track here. All right, so when you when you have to view a rule, you can find that one rule. If you want to view all rules, it's very difficult to go back and understand who did what when. Basically, it's just a long audit process. Similarly, uh, rule ownership is hard to understand. Who owns that rule, right? Especially when you have shared objects and similar things. Uh, traversing multiple security points just kind of complicates things. Various different firewalls and different edge control uh, uh, components that are there. <clears throat> One of the things I've noted is that firewalls grow exponentially, but they're rarely removed. <clears throat> okay, so now we're into the crux of it, next generation firewall uh, automation. And this is what I'm gonna say is uh, around the idea of application-centric firewall automation. So it's a source of truth that models applications and their relationships between them. And that's the crux of what we're doing here is data modeling around applications and then how they interact with each other. <clears throat> so application dictionary is a term I've been using for well over a decade. Uh, it's not a industry standard. I've never really heard anyone else talking about uh, such, a, such an idea, so I just kind of uh, created this. So if you go investigate, you're probably likely just to find uh, other things I've done before. But nonetheless, without lack of uh, an industry standard term, this is the term I'm going to go with. <clears throat> So this is what we want to do, is we want to allow bit, uh, businesses to speak in business terms, right? What are the applications uh, looking, uh, what are the users looking to do? They want to say something like CRM API can talk to the CRM DB. Those are the terms they want to. Instead, what they have to do is from this specific IP to this specific IP on that specific port, right? We want to get away with that. That's a very technical for the average user of, of, of these firewall rules and security posture and overall. <clears throat> there's a, a side benefit to assign metadata to application, and there's many different things you can do with that to understand you, your security posture much better, to understand things like confidentiality uh, of data, uh, who the owners are, encryption, etc. <clears throat> Manage non-firewall control points. And what I mean by that is we have AWS security groups, firewall D, et cetera. And we'll talk about that a few more times throughout here. And uh, how do we manage that? And, it's, and the idea here is by modeling the infrastructure, not just modeling firewall rules, right? It's a change in kind of concepts there. <clears throat> Rule optimization to remove duplicate and unnecessary rules. And we're going through, through a specific example of how we're gonna do this. But the idea here is if we have uh, security enforcement happening in AWS security groups, 
why do I then need to have additional firewall rules uh, to say exactly the same thing as those security groups are already providing? <clears throat> and provide full firewall rule configuration, often use the term uh, declarative. The current generation is transactional in nature. Push configurations, and that data is for the most part gone and lost forever, right? You, do, you can go back to the ITSM tool or whatever tool that you, you put it in to find that information, but it's, it, it's not readily available. It's not easy to track. It's hard to do so. And you can't rebuild the current state from that. <clears throat> okay. So some of the complications of a modern network. No longer is source and destination IP and DNS the end-all be-all for uh, uh, what those source and destination uh, objects can be. Uh, it said there's things like uh, LDAP groups, uh, contain, you know, uh, container services, app ID, et cetera, SaaS services. NAT and VIPs, this is where users may not realize uh, or application owners may not realize that the uh, IPs that their, their servers are on are not the IPs that their users are going to need and to put the firewall rules to the VIP, not to their own, uh, their own actual devices. It's kind of hard for them to track that information. Okay, edge enforcement, kind of talked about that before. You know, uh, in for, you know, there's multiple layers of security and all having a duplication of efforts. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of the design around the application dictionary. It starts with defining applications, things like CRMDB, is this IP with this port? CRM API, is this IP with this port, etc. Then defining the relationships between those applications. Right, so I want my uh, uh, SMP server to reach out to my CRM application to manage it and kind of make sure that everything is, is monitored correctly. I want my CRM application to reach out to LDAP service, as an example. You still go through that security review process as you uh, would in any kind of scenario to ensure that this is required. One of the, inter inter <laughs> one of the inter interesting uh, use cases that come with this is the idea of having the application owner in, uh, into that process as well. To do things like say, uh, for my LDAP service, I don't need to do it, just let you know, anyone can have access to it. But for my HR application, I want to know who is accessing my data in my database, and I want to be part of that security process. And since we know who the application owner is, we can embed them into it. And then of course, the configuration management aspect of it, to actually deploy the configuration. Okay, so we'll take an example from, from uh, the previous slide and show how we do this. And we're gonna take the access request, the source and destination, and combine it with the application definitions to show how we get to this five tuple uh, firewall rule configuration that we're all used to. Right, so we, we, we can uh, mind map how we translate from the source IP and destination IP ports to build out that firewall rule. <clears throat> In this demonstration, just kind of quickly review the uh, automation stack. So we're using Notabot as the open source source of truth automation platform. Application dictionary, which is a plugin, primary objective what we're talking about. The, it, we have a separate plugin for a firewall model. It may seem a little bit counterintuitive, actually helps some, solve some interesting problems. And then using Kapirka, I believe that's how you pronounce it. I never, never heard anyone say it before. And what this does is model from a you know, policy and service uh, terminology that uh, Kapirka uses to uh, the vendor specific. Specifically, we're using Palo, but it can translate to JunoS, XR, ASAs, et cetera. And then finally, use Nornir to, to deploy the configurations. <clears throat> okay, so the workflow for this is user makes a request. That request can be adding an, uh, an application, adding to an existing application, or one of those relationships between those applications. There is an ETL process, ETL standing for extract, transform, and load. The key part of that is the transform part, right? And what that allows us to do is to have a point to put apply business logic to optimize our rules, right? <clears throat> then it gets to the, the, the firewall model, which it does just that and models firewall rules. Kapirka generates configuration, and then finally Nornir is used to deploy those configuration to the edge device. Okay, demo time. Let's see how this goes here. Uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add an application and deploy configuration.
look at the application definition here. And we'll see that uh, we're going to hone in on the HR application and talk about some of that metadata I was referring to before and, and how that relates. So we have simple things like description, but more importantly, things like who is the application owner, right? This is one of the things I find uh, that organizations don't do well is to understand who owns applications. Uh, which components, specifically, which VMs are being used here in the Amsterdam uh, data center? In this example, which services are applied here? Meaning, which uh, uh, TCP ports are used? What's the justification? What's the confidential uh, confidentiality level of that? And then from this view, we can see the relationships that are inbound and outbound from that application here. Right? And we're going to specifically hone in on this LDAP here. And we're going to show how Jersey City Firewall cares about the, this application that really only exists in Amsterdam Data Center. Right? <clears throat> okay, so we look at the, the, the Jersey City Firewall, and we can uh, under, start understanding how to mind map the, these applications. And specifically, we'll look at this first one from the HR to the L, uh, LDAP service. The HR application existing in the Amsterdam office having a destination in Jersey City uh, data center. Right? But how does it relate that traffic to know to go to the Jersey City firewall? Because the Jersey City virtual machine, or the, the LDAP server in Jersey City, has an IP address in the 103050 range, and we defined a zone that has that network. So we're able to stitch together and dynamically build out that relationship on the fly to understand how applications uh, are stitched together and the associated uh, uh, configurations that get deployed from them. Okay, great. So uh, one of the interesting uh, challenges I talked before about that, that ATL, that, that transform step here, and we're gonna jump into that here uh, this, this transformation step, as I was building this out, I realized that the Atlanta firewall in this, this demo here has all the monitoring stuff, uh, traffic. So it's a lot of source or destination, depending on its SNP or syslog, used over and over and over again, right? So constantly going from monitoring to auth, CRM, all these different kind of components. It's a service use constantly, similar for syslog and LDAP. And so when we look at the uh, Atlanta firewall here, we're going to see that we've defined all the application dictionary view of the world between the relationships between all of them. However, we have that transform step to understand business logic. And the business logic I applied here was to uh, create address groups and group together these common services, such as SNP, syslog, and LDAP. Right? So we see over and over, same source IP, different destination IP, same source IP, destination IP for SNP, the reverse true for syslog and, you know, and respectively for LDAP service as well. <clears throat> okay, so we have this, you know, eight, nine times here, however many kind of uh, uh, rules are shown here on the applica uh, application dictionary side of it. And then we're gonna scroll down here in a second, which is gonna show us the firewall rule model, which is very similar view, but you're gonna see how the configurations are generated differently, and the model is different because of that business logic that we use in that transformation step here. Okay, great. <clears throat> so what we did was, rather than just copy the rules over, we said, insert that business logic and say, we'll just create a, a, uh, a destination address group for the SNP managed services or a source address group, and then we aggregate all those rules together we're still tracking all that metadata, who's the rule owner, who put this in, when, why, et cetera. The configurations are a, uh, a, an artifact of the data model. The firewall rules are not the data model in this, in this uh, scenario, right? And that fundamentally changes it. And this is just one use case, but there's are many other use cases, such as I mentioned before, just ignoring rules, allowing things open from an IP level because AWS is, 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 is managing that security posture. So why create those duplicate firewalls? <clears throat> I know I'm quick here, but just wanna show the uh, firewall policy is being deployed. It is pretty much, it's the same configuration, the same five rules are applied on both sides of this uh, scenario. So the Jersey City Firewall data model, 
looks just like the actual configuration uh, on the actual uh, the Palo Alto firewall. <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna jump into actually configuring an application uh, and specifically the dependencies. So we have the CRM application just being created and we're gonna build all the dependencies here. And that means connecting to the DB, connecting to LDAP and then the monitoring services as well. Okay, so we'll show how we build these dependencies and how that actually uh, gets, uh, how that actually gets to, uh, sorry, uh, how that actually gets deployed. I'm quickly creating the application the dependencies here. Uh, just note that it's happening. It's, it's pretty, pretty quick, not too interesting, I would say. Okay, so now all the mappings are, are shown, or are built. Uh, we will go to the, the dependencies view of this table. And from there, we're gonna understand, um, and we, we will see the CRM application upon refresh start showing between all these application uh, dependencies that are shown here. Okay, great, and then we'll see the CRM used multiple times, go into that, and we can see the inbound and outbound dependencies are dynamically built throughout the entire process. Okay, so now when we go back to the Jersey City Firewall, which has the CRM application, we will immediately see the changes in the application dictionary, but not the firewall model. And the reason that is, is it goes back to that ETL process, that transformation step, that synchronization step. That's a second step, purposefully a second step that happens. So we have a job here to sync the databases. We will run that job, which will sync between the three different firewalls, firewall, <coughs> excuse me, the three different firewall, uh, 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 firewalls, firewalls, <laughs> apologies, uh, that are out there. And we could see that we've now added the CRM application uh, to, to this, the, this steps, series of steps. So the only thing left to really do here is to then push the configuration. That's what we're all here for, right? Actually pushing the, uh, the configuration to uh, the edge firewall. And we have another job there that's dedicated just for that, to push that configuration from the data model to the Palo Alto device, okay? And I'm gonna deploy it, jump back, show you what the firewall will look like before on the Palo side. You'll see that it, the last uh, rule there is not a CRM rule. We'll see the Comprica, uh, the uh, Comprica, uh configuration syntax. And then upon refresh, we'll see that all of the, uh, we'll see that the CRM firewall uh, rule has now been added to there and is now in sync with the intended state source of truth here. Awesome, so that's the demonstration there. Um, so I'll jump into kind of uh, uh, availability. I do want to stop here for one second and just say that um, I really want to evangelize the idea more than any kind of uh, solution here. Um, we're still building this, this out. I, I, this concept I think is needed in the industry more so than um, you know, talking about that specific solution. I think bringing, building solution brings it to life. And that's why I really enjoy this. Um, but I don't wanna conflate the two there. Okay, so we, uh, availability, Nodabot's open source currently. We, the Nodabot firewall model, which is gonna be kind of uh, underlining is being uh, is scheduled to be released this quarter. And then the application dictionary for next quarter to be open source. Okay, and that's it, thanks. Uh, I've been talking about this a few times for other places, so here's some links to hear me talk about this uh, uh, at other places as well. Do we have any questions from the audience? We got one question online here. Uh, this is from Gus. Gus says, how does Natobot compare to the solutions such as TUFN's product? Within, yeah. Okay. That's secure app too. Not much administrative work is needed to keep the information accurate in Nudabot. Does Nudabot offer a new offer any way to check rules 
being added to a firewall security policy. Okay, yeah, so for Tufin, uh, Tufin and Algosec and Fireman, uh, similar in, this, uh, in that space, and they kind of understand mathematically how firewall rules uh, are used. They're gonna have better things for things like path analysis and so forth, but it's fundamentally a different solution, right? This is to data model applications, and that's to, to data model firewall rules, right? So it's fundamentally different. Uh, the next part was how much work is keeping the information? A lot. That's the biggest drawback for sure. It is fundamentally you require organizational commitment to do something like this, okay? Um, but it gives you, there's a lot of side benefits for that. Um, any ability to, to check? Um, nothing specifically right out of the box, but you know, the whole idea of the platform is similar to many other platforms, you know, ServiceNow, Ansible, et cetera. It's more frameworky, meaning it's intended to allow for flexibility and expansion of other services to be built on top of it. Our next question comes from Al. Can the Natabot tool audit the firewall rules against its own data model in the case of manual rules introduced? Yeah, um, I, I don't want to say it's not trivial. It's, 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 a, it's a bit of an ask. It goes back to the flexibility thing. Um, it was definitely one of the things, that, it's such a use case, I'd want to kind of deep dive and, and, and work on. Um, the separation between these two models, between the application dictionary and the firewall model, um, actually one of the nice side benefits of that is the ability to uh, have a transition period, to go from one world to another, just traditional firewall rule management to an, this application-centric view of it. Um, but definitely a use case I'm, I'm interested in as well. We have one from the floor. Uh, David Farmer, University of Minnesota. I got a, one minor detail. You have a nice application model. How do you get the application owners and the application creators to help you fill out that model instead of having to reverse engineer it? It, it has to be a top-down approach. It fundamentally has to be a top-down approach. It requires organizational commitment, for sure. The organization needs to understand the value that the, the lack of security posture, the firewall rule sprawl, the lack of understanding of applications, uh, the lack of shared ownership between that. One of the interesting things, I, I've, I've been in several conversations with customers where I've asked the application owner and the security team says, who owns the rule? And they both do this, right? So in essence, nobody owns a rule, right? Which fundamentally means that it has to be positioned from top down to say, this is important. And this has to do with our security posture, et cetera. It, it's not an easy thing. I, I said that that would be the, the biggest flaw. Uh, uh, to something like this. But there's many uh, side benefits, side effects, et cetera, for having this data. And there's just so much more metadata to, to gather on applications uh, that just the metadata alone is, is, is worth a lot. Oh, we got one more. We got a minute left. This is a, oh, geez. First Nanog, first question from Brian Davenport at Team Country. Um, I was just curious. You kind of mentioned it's top down. So where do you see the resistance come in in an organization typically? Is it the firewall owners or the network people or the application? Like where do you most the, see the resistance? The I mean, listen, the, this, the firewall rule problem has been a data nightmare since its inception. It is basically everyone throwing the data over the fence and saying deal with the security team, right? So why do the application owners want to change? Right, and so that the, the application owners, the local IT, the people pulling the requests don't want to necessarily change that because to them it's, you know, maybe it's slow, but why should they have ownership? So that's pretty much uniformly where I say it. All right, 23 seconds to spare. Awesome. Round of applause for yeah. 10, please. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.